We're going to start. Everybody, thanks for coming. It's great to be here at HRU. You're going to have to speak really loud. Okay, so I'll speak really loud. Uh, my name is Bryn McCagg, and I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Recruitify, which is a crowdsourcing tool to help companies hire more easily and faster and better. And, you know, I'm here to talk about today um, sort of the, the convergence of um, the crowdsourcing economy, the sharing economy, or the on-demand economy, whatever you want to call it, those three things, I think, have converged to change many aspects of our economy um, and are going to have a huge impact on a lot of parts of our economy, but in particular, I think it will have a big impact on recruiting and on HR. And so let me just open up with a question. Who here thinks they could make a number two pencil from scratch if they had to? Well, okay, you guys are really smart. Some people think they actually can. It can't be done. Without collaboration and people helping and collective knowledge, there's nobody that could make even the simplest thing in our economy, a number two pencil. You think about it. The lead, the wood, the glue, the, the paint, the enamel, the copper, the eraser. I mean, it's such a simple device. And human's greatest invention... Uh, I believe, was the ability to collect and store our, our collective knowledge um, and, and access our collective intelligence and be able to collaborate um, on our collective efforts. And that is what uh, enabled us to make something as simple as the number two pencil and obviously gave us a huge advantage over every other species on the world. Um, and what's happened is, is that uh, the invention of the smart devices that are pretty much ubiquitous at this point, I think has put that uh, advantage on steroids uh, massively. And there's a lot of examples of it, which I'll go into, but the, the fact that we can sit here with a smartphone or a computer or whatever device and connect with other people and share our knowledge or share our wisdom or share our physical efforts or share our assets, um, and utilize them more effectively, I think, again, is having a tremendous impact on every sector of our economy. So I'll give you a couple examples um, and, and, and interrupt if you have any questions or you want to comment or thoughts. But, um, you know, I think Wikipedia was an early example. Uh, you know, the, in, in the old days, you know, thousands of years ago, people memorized stories. You know, the Iliad and the Odyssey were memorized by people. And... They were, they were a tradition of telling stories and memorizing things and handing them down around the campfire. And then we invented the printing press, and that we started to be able to store knowledge in books. And now, the best-selling book for the last 150 years was the Encyclopedia Britannica. And that had been in business, I think, for about 250 years. Within 11 years of launch, Wikipedia wiped them out. And Encyclopedia Botanica, sadly, is gone. But the impact is that um, Wikipedia now has something like, what is it, 35 million articles. Uh, they are the sixth ranked site in the world. And they obviously have created a huge amount of utility and value for everybody that uses it, right, in sharing knowledge. Another example, an earlier example of this whole concept of sharing assets is Zipcar. And in fact, there was an article yesterday in the Wall Street Journal. It's now cheaper actually to share a car, whether it's through Zipcar, Uber, or whatever, than it is to own a car. Um, in, if you drive less than 10,000 miles a year, than to own a car. Um, so that's a pretty phenomenal outcome because I was actually going to go car shopping on Saturday morning, and it's making me <laughs> rethink it. I was like, wait, the garage, the insurance, the car, and I did the math, and it really was actually quite a bit cheaper. Uh, it was about half the price, given the amount I drive in the city. So um, the implications are huge. I think Zipcar was an early pioneer in allowing us to share cars, and, and, and it worked successfully. And people shared cars, and those cars were utilized much at a much higher rate, which also has implications for the, how we utilize assets, the environment, and everything else, and the ability to access those cars and having them work. Um, I think the two companies, though, that have invented a model that are going to dramatically change most sectors of our economy are Uber and Airbnb. And they've taken those early models and really put them on, on steroids again. And the reason why is because it's not just sharing not one thing, knowledge with Wikipedia or an asset, a car with uh, Zipcar. 
it's sharing not only the knowledge, it's sharing the logistics, it's sharing the physical asset, and it's sharing also our ratings of the, the, the ability to rate the quality. And as a result, if you look at you know, a company like Uber, transportation has been around since you know, probably way before the Romans, but the oldest taxi cab company in the world, I found out, is almost 400 years old in Paris. Uh, obviously, they were horse and buggy in the old days, but they're still in, in business. Um, Uber has obviously created massive disruption, and yeah, they have growing pains, and I know there's controversy here and there, but at the end of the day, they're here to stay, and they have a, they've, they've created over 165,000 drivers around the world. Those are jobs that either are new or people that were in car, maybe taxis before, uh, are now driving at their own pace when they want to drive, and the capacity utilization of an Uber car is more than double a yellow cab. So they're not hunting for passengers, they're being delivered passengers. And those passengers can rate the, the driver and vice versa, and that's just creating a much better experience for everybody. I think an Uber driver, uh, while they, I know some of them are protesting, the reality is they're a lot happier doing their job than a yellow cab driver, just go ask them. Uh, I mean, I know the press likes to jump on it and create controversy, but um, you know, as Airbnb said to us last, uh, at an event we spoke at, he said, last year we had something like you know, two or three rave parties where people destroyed the house out of like hundreds of thousands of houses. How many times has that happened at hotels? Thing is, it's no news story to say that 99% of the time there's no event when an Airbnb person checks in and checks out. It's a news story when somebody trashes the house. But that happens, frankly, probably every day at some hotel room around the, around the world. It's just not news. It's old news. Nobody's interested in hearing about it. Uber has created a $44 billion company in just a couple of years, obviously by far the biggest taxi company, probably the biggest transportation company in the world, um, if you think of them as transportation, um, creating a lot of jobs and definitely delivering a product that's pretty delightful to use. So that's a good example uh, of, of, you know, again, companies using collective assets, collective knowledge, and, and, uh, and collective resources. The next one is Airbnb. And hotels have been around since the dawn of uh, civilization. But in a few short years, Airbnb is bigger than any hotel chain. They drove $632 million of revenue into the New York economy last year alone. That's $632 million that homeowners now are getting into their own pockets. So it's an incredible multiplier effect. And they have 350,000 hosts around the world. And they have at least a $13 billion valuation. I'll bet you at their next round, they'll be a lot higher than that, given, given their growth rate. So and what have they delivered? Go on to Airbnb and go rent a, ho a hotel in, in Rome, and then go and see the, the size and the, and, the, and the quality of the houses that you can rent for the same price. I mean, it's, there's no comparison. You can rent a villa for the, for the price of a Four Seasons hotel and in a much better location. So um, they're just delivering a different kind of a product, enriching everybody that's using it, and giving people a new source of income. And we're utilizing houses more. So people are, can get away from this idea of owning everything. They can share it, in a sense, in a controlled way. And, the, and, the, and the, the beauty of the smartphone and the ability to connect is it actually is relocalizing everything. So the idea of Airbnb before these devices and rating systems would have been scary, letting some stranger into your house. But now we live in a world that's highly localized. If you have a bad rating on Airbnb, nobody rents your house. So you covet that rating. And I know that because I rent a house out on Airbnb. So I have good ratings, and I really am careful about that because I know if I get bad ratings, I'm not going to get any more renters. So I'm very protective of my online Airbnb reputation. And I think that that's something that this collaboration and networking has, has enabled. So I'll just pause there. Any thoughts, questions? Because I want to get into how this is, I think, going to impact HR. Well, at yesterday's event, we had a company called Coach Market presenting, which is basically applying the same, uh, the same concept of sharing economy to the uh, learning and development market. So basically what they did is they created a marketplace for coaches and trainers um, that companies can hire on demand. So they don't have to have a, a big internal uh, L&D department and they can use those on-demand trainers to uh, sort of 
when they have spikes in the needs uh, in terms of um, trainers and coaches inside our organization. And that's, that's an example um, of a company that does similar things. And basically, this is a sharing economy model uh, inside uh, HR or learning and development. It's, it's a great idea. And I just was at a dinner last week in Silicon Valley where they had people present sort of the 10 what they thought most disruptive ideas. And actually, the disruption of our educational system was the one that won the, uh, the dinner. The, it was sort of a, a competition in the idea that most universities over the next 10 or 20 years are going to go bankrupt because people are going to be able to learn in a distributed fashion. And teachers, you know, they don't need to be, uh, you know, working at a, at a university with tenure, getting paid, not teaching classes, and not doing anything, a lot of them, uh, where they, you know, great teachers can be just, you know, on demand. And so whether it's coaching or teaching, uh, I think that we're going to see a lot of on-demand or collaboration or sharing in that, in that area of the economy for sure. I mean, obviously, the HR recruiting space has been a challenging space. It's an enormous industry, you know, depending who you believe. It's you know, $150 billion industry, I think, according to LinkedIn's latest report, whatever. It's, it's a huge industry, as we all know. And if you ask the CEO of every Fortune 1000 company or any, any CEO of any company, what's their number one asset? I guarantee you 99% of them will say they're human capital. So we're in an exciting industry, uh, but it's just been fraught with you know, a lot of inefficiencies. And if you go into these HR talent acquisition departments, um, there's just a tremendous inefficiency in trying to source people and trying to get them on board. And there's sort of this war on talent. It's all about you know, more noise going back and forth. And I think a couple of the earlier um, companies that should change the game was Elance. I, I mean, I love the model. Basically, it's like, you know, you can work anywhere. You can, you can uh, rent a, a person's skills and expertise. You can see how good they are based on their prior ratings. And they can charge what they're worth. And they can work agilely. This idea that we work in a constructed 9 to 5 economy, you know, Henry Ford set it up for us. And I think we've been marching to that tune for the last 100 years. But it's not a natural way of, of living. We used to live in a much more organic uh, sort of workflow environment. You worked when you needed to work and, and you know, did your other things when you needed to do that. And I think that the economy is moving towards that. And I think Elance was a really innovative company to let people just work wherever and also deliver up the best. You know, the best might be around the block, but the best might also be over in India or wherever. It just doesn't matter where they are anymore, and it's flattened the world for sure. So I would put Elance up there as a real early innovator and a great company. Um, I think Zenefits recently has um, created some jaw-dropping numbers. Are they raised, how much have they raised recently? 60 million. We were discussing that uh, yesterday at the event about the evaluation that they had and the mo actually multiple that they applied when valuing the company. And it was like they had revenue of 1 million, 2 million, 3 million, so something like very small, ridiculous, uh, but ha that th they had that valuation that was 200. So basically, companies uh, and investors really believe in that model, and they prove it to their money. Right. Wow. I got to find their investors. <laughs> <laughs> Some, something, though, that's interesting about Zenefits is uh, all, all of these types, Airbnb, Uber, Zenefits, they're upsetting the Apple card, you know? So you see regulatory things coming in for Airbnb. You know, you've, you've got the uh, uh, city of New York trying to fight Airbnb and say that it's taking away from its hotel industry. You've got, uh, you know, medallions for Uber uh, peaked at over a million dollars, uh, like the, the single highest um, uh, what, in, in inflationary item on the planet. A, a gallon of milk since the 1940s has gone up 600 percent. A taxi medallion has gone up 46,000 percent from $2,500 to over a million dollars. And in the last year, companies like Uber and Lyft have knocked it back down to 800,000, a huge drop in, in a matter of like six months. Uh, and, and you're starting to see that with Zenefits, uh, so you know that they're a real player regardless of their, uh, of their yeah, revenue. Right. P -p yeah, p people are scared, and, and so Utah, I think it was uh, the state of Utah, I, I don't know what it was, uh, but they're, they're challenging their model because they give away uh, the, the platform for free. <laughs> Uh, and then try to get people to buy uh, benefits, you know, try to buy insurance on the back end, and they're saying that's an illegal kickback. Whether it is or it isn't, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens in the next couple of, uh, couple of months and years, but, but just the fact that somebody's trying to step in and take legal action means that they're on the right, right path, so. Has anybody tried to see your profile yet? Not yet, but so any day now. That, that's when we know we've made it, <laughs> when, when you get sued. <laughs>
No, uh, these new models, again, out of the HR space or in the HR space are certainly scaring the incumbents. And I think Zenefits is obviously, as Norm pointed out, a great example. You know, they're giving away the, uh, the razor and, and, uh, and charging for the blade, basically. You know, have a whole full HR suite for free and, you know, ideally buy the insurance through them. And that's obviously a scary proposition for a lot of incumbents um, who made a lot of money selling HR technologies that now can be had for basically free. And it's, I think it's an incredible concept. And uh, we, we, I plan to watch them closely because it's a great idea. And I certainly think it can be duplicated in other areas uh, in HR and in other areas of our economy. So there's a great example. I think ZipRecruiter and there's a, some, some, a couple of others that have done it in the applicant tracking space, you know, give away the ATS um, and, and, and then charge for the sourcing of candidates. Another great idea, you know, who needs to pay for an ATS? Um, the ones you pay for, the more you pay, probably the worse they are. So uh, that's the reality. <laughs> so, um, you know, there's probably an inverse relationship there. So. Um, I think that's a, that's a whole interesting category of products. The, the free ATSs are the real cheap ATSs that have kind of come along in the last few years, and they're sort of making their money on the back end with other services. That's pretty neat. And then that's and then Recruitify. I'll just tell you quickly what we do. Um, for those who don't know, um, our our application is designed extremely similar to Uber. It works like uh, the work, Uber or workflow, where companies instead of ordering up a taxi, they're ordering up candidates. And instead of a taxi driver delivering a car, our crowd of recruiters are um, very uh, matched in an extremely precise way to jobs, and they're delivering candidates to specific jobs. And in, in uh, I mean, we're, we launched in sort of an alpha last uh, quarter, and this, this quarter we're still in our beta. But just in a couple of months, we have over 2,500 recruiters. Hydric and Struggles, which is the largest uh, publicly traded headhunting firm and has been in business since the late 40s, has 1,500 employees. So in about four months, we have more recruiters in our network than Hydric and Struggles has employees. If things continue the way they are, I will tell you right now, in a year or two, we'll have more recruiters in our network than all the recruiting companies and staffing companies combined. Because actually a lot of the staffing companies are joining us. And they're actually signing up their recruiters as suppliers because it's a way for them to essentially sell candidates on an on-demand basis. And that's the way it's working. In fact, we just uh, placed, I think, uh, the fastest hire ever made at a, very, a top uh, consulting company. In 23 hours, they found on our platform a candidate for a PeopleSoft integration job um, that was about a $140,000 job. So they sent out the job cast, and the crowd delivered results in 23 hours and they made a hire. It took them 47 days to make the hire. So they didn't, they, they didn't hire in 23 hours. But we, they found the candidate in 23 hours. And we're pretty much can uh, assure comp clients that within three or four or five days, you're going you're gonna to find your hire pretty much every time now for any position from admin all the way up to maybe like a managing director. We don't see a lot of C-suite jobs, but it's, kind of, it's going across pretty much every industry. Uh, it's mostly Fortune 500 companies that are coming to us. As the, as the buyers of candidates, and the recruiters are all over the world. Some of our best recruiters are in India, and some of them are top staffing firms right here in New York. And they can either work for a company or they can work independently. How they source, you know, they, they figure that out. They source their, their candidates, and then they, and then they uh, push them out to the jobs that are sent to them. And again, it's a very precise. Recruiters that get on it get jobs that are very precisely matched to the roles they focus on, the industries, the location, and also their scores and activity on our site. So good recruiters get more jobs. Recruiters that do a bad job get quickly scored off. It's like a bad house on Airbnb, and that's how it works. Uh, can I ask a question to the audience? So uh, any, any of you have ever used a marketplace type of model to hire? You have. Which one? Oh. Oh, really? OK. <laughs> Uh, okay, interesting. And yeah, well, actually, I I, I wanted to.
Okay. But uh, you, Matsik, you wanted to say something or just to re re company which is called talent market and that was like uh, um, uh, recruiters but from agencies and they were bidding for the uh, for the job okay. Did it work? no, no. <laughs> but I think it's it was too uh, too early because it was 2000 I think at seven okay. something like that but I think it will be a market for right. that yeah especially for that independent uh, recruiters like here you know comment that asked the same question in San Francisco um, at a similar event and I actually had few people in the audience who used a uh, marketplace model for recruitment uh, and actually there is one company exactly particular company that they used it's called Zenif Talent so basically there are two two types of marketplaces the first type is open marketplace like Recruitify where you have uh, where you basically have candidates who can directly go to the platform and post the job requisitions and get, get candidates. And there is the second type of marketplace, which is a closed marketplace, where you have a normal recruitment company that does all the sales and business development, and you have a back end, which is basically a marketplace of recruiters who can submit, uh, submit, submit candidates to the role. So in San Francisco, it's already like being actively used. However, in New York, I still haven't seen many, many companies using um, any of those uh, types of uh, recruitment marketplaces. So how, w w can you share like experience of your clients? Yeah, so I, it's still early days for us and other companies in kind of the marketplace for, for HR services. But I think the, the early results are, are super impressive. Um, we're definitely getting a lot of companies coming to us and and thinking and, and, and looking at us as a strategic um, sourcing solution for a portion of their jobs where we can be so act like a recruiting processing outsourcing company and do so without a long-term contract, without any disruption of their people, and they only uh, use us when they need us, and they only pay for us when they get a result. When the, uh, our economic model is when a hire is made, we charge a flat 14% fee of base salary, so $100,000 we charge 14,000. And then we send, we pay our recruiters 11 points out of the 14. So uh, all the recruiters that participate in a job cast get a little bit of money if their candidate was indicated that they were liked by the company. Um, and then the winning recruiter gets 10, 10, 10 points or 10,000 in the example of a $14,000 fee. So the people who don't submit candidates are not the hire. They, they score a bucks too. Yep, they typically get anywhere from being 50 to. Yeah. Yep. As long as the you're company is in. With them. I'm sorry? You're rev sharing with them. Yeah, what we're doing is we're gamifying it. So recruiters are, are uh, incented to participate because they get points and money even if they don't make the hire. So they might get 50 to 250 bucks on average for submitting a good candidate. A candidate gets submitted. The company that looks at, the, when the company's looking at candidates, they have to sort the candidates into an interested or not interested bucket to move to the next candidate. So we're for they're, they're, it's super easy to use, but that's scoring the recruiter. And that is also how we calculate the payout. So the recruiters, uh, if you put two candidates into an interested bucket, that recruiter will get paid for those interested candidates a little bit of money. And then if you make a hire, they get paid on average about $10,000 for a hire. So the algorithm of how we match jobs to recruiters is not, uh, it's not about blasting a shotgun of recruiters. It's actually about taking our 2,000 recruiters and rifling five or 10, the exact ones. And it's the ones that not only have indicated that themselves of, of what their focus is, but also we can measure exactly how they're performing. And we also pace it based on their capacity. We're not looking to over, um, overload the recruiters with a lot of jobs. We want to have them so they have a high likelihood of responding and a reasonably good chance of at least getting some payout or getting points or, or winning and making the hire. I would like to use this opportunity because I, I cannot not take advantage of it. So let, as a fund, we are currently considering Recruitify as an interesting investment opportunity and we are actually tracking many companies in that space. So I'm doing market taste, testing basically and asking them companies and experts if that is an interesting model and that could work. So I wanted to get feedback from actual recruiters. Would they use that? Why or why not? And would that, do, do they share my opinion that this model is the future of the recruitment market? Kara, can you be the first one? 
Uh, so a couple of things um, from my own experience then with my clients um, today. You, I probably five years ago started evangelizing while I was still a, a VP of TA that we need to, st don't sell me a job posting. I don't want to pay you to just put a job posting up and I don't know if I ever get anybody any good. And my ATS is so crappy, I don't know if I get anybody at all. So, um, you know, the risk was all on me. So definitely seeing the move towards, you know, pay for, for performance. Um, you know, it feels right now a little bit more like it would be something a lot of my current clients would use um, if they weren't able to find a candidate on their own because it does have a, a higher fee. It feels like a headhunter kind of involvement, but then they don't have to go look out for those people and they don't have to negotiate the contracts and they don't have to, as a big enterprise, you don't have to get your procurement department involved in all those things. And so this would, and particularly if I could pay you on a credit card, um, you know, it would make things extremely easy. And I think you'd start to see some momentum that way. So yes, is the answer. I think you'll have early adopters like the Silicon Valley firms and then you know, start to move in that direction. But it definitely still feels like that's where I would go before I put it out to my network of agencies, so to speak. Interesting. Uh, can you share your perspective? Well, I would ask, I, I have a large recruiting team. I'm a recruiting manager for ZocDoc, and we have uh, probably at least 35 internal recruiters. I would assume that they would be also allowed to join your network and, and sort of work on the side, if you will. How would that impact, I guess, them delivering what we need first before they're trying to kind of make a buck on the side. You know, that would be my concern as a, as a recruiting manager. So two, two things. Um, let me first address the first couple things on the first comment. Is that we um, totally recommend to companies that they use um, their internal sourcing techniques first. And in fact, we wrote a white paper on it and recommend you should always promote people internally or use internal referrals. And you know, it's good for a company to have a, a strong referral network program. And that's the best way to hire people. But it's hard to scale. And then if you've done those things at your ATS, you could source and you're getting a million people in your ATS and have an unsearchable database. Job boards don't really work anymore. And then you can go to LinkedIn. And LinkedIn is a lot of hunting. And the results, as far as I can tell from everyone I speak to, are going down because everyone's pinging the same people. So at the end, you're kind of left with, what do you do then? You can go hire a headhunter. But the way a lot of companies are using us is they're actually starting to use us as a vendor management tool, too. So they're actually telling their recruiters to sign up for our platform. And what they do is they eliminate 20 or 30 contracts down to one. They eliminate a lot of unnecessary cycles of communication for both them and the recruiters, because that, that happens a lot with you know, third-party headhunters. And they also then cut their fees in half. And you might say, well, why would a recruiter that's working for you now for 20 or 30 or 33 percent be willing to now work for a net 10 percent? They're actually loving it, because what happens is they, they, first of all, they do it because the big companies are starting to tell them that's the reality. And number two, we're cutting out a lot of their work. They don't have to go out and get the business. They don't have to negotiate contracts. They don't have to go back and forth through a lot of communication cycles, and they don't have to worry about collections. So we take care of all of that, and they're focused on what they're good at, which is sourcing, identify sourcing and vetting and prying loose good candidates from positions that are uh, made they're a passive candidate that's sitting there that's not really responding to phone calls or whatever. That recruiter is highly motivated by money to pry that candidate loose and you know, lift up their head and make them interested in your position. That's what a good recruiter will do, and that's the value that they should be paid for. So that's the, how companies are using us. Mm -hmm. And just as an aside, it's interesting. I thought it would be more small companies that are adopting us. We're, we're, we're almost exclusively at the Fortune 1000. I mean, we'll take in small companies, but the big companies are where they have a huge amount of capacity problem. They can't fill hundreds or thousands of positions and they just need a new new channel. And that's who's coming to us mostly. Well, and I think what also is happening is the, the post-recession recovery and large companies do this. They take forever <coughs> to then rebuild the recruiting team that they cut um, because recruiters are really good at figuring out a way to get things done. Um, and so they were able to keep hiring even though there's only a third of them left and they're very reluctant to add staff. And so you know, at $10,000, $14,000 for the hard to fill positions is less than bringing on a, a very senior um, you know, recruiter who might fill your executive positions or your, your senior level jobs. So that's really interesting. A solution keeps popping in my mind that I don't even know is still in the marketplace, but sounds familiar to me of bounty jobs. Yeah. Is, are they, are they, are, do you consider them a competitor? Or are they even still around? I, I don't know the answer to that question. 
I don't know. They're still around? Okay, okay. I, they're really not a competitor in any way. I mean, again, they're more of a, I don't really know too much about their model, but we're a transactional system that allows you with a press of a button to leverage our crowd of 2,500 and growing significantly recruiters in a highly targeted way and create a transaction. I, I would compare it to, they're sort of like dial 777 cars, we're Uber. I mean, it, it, you will get a result in days on our platform, and it's about the candidate. It's not about interacting with the recruiter. In fact, on our platform, when you send out a job cast, you don't even see the recruiters. Our algorithms match it to the right recruiters. Typically, in four or five days, you see results back, and then you see who the recruiter is. When they submit a candidate, um, you can then contact the recruiter, but you really don't need to. You can if you want, and only if you as the company contact the recruiter can they contact you back. So it's just a different transactional model. I think Bounty Jobs is more of a, it's a, a search. All, yeah, it's more of a all-commerce kind process, of thing. Yeah. But I want to make sure I address your early concern, because you raise a really interesting question. In fact, Kevin Manny of Newsweek wrote a feature article on us about three weeks ago in Newsweek on how we're changing who could be and can be a recruiter. And it's interesting because we have recruiters as far away as India that are great. I mean, some of our best recruiters, honestly, are just independent guys. But we also have big staffing firms like Princeton Information Systems, which has several hundred people that are staffers. And this is a new channel for them to uh, generate revenue and, in a sense, sell more candidates and increase their velocity. Now, the idea that a company, people at companies could sign up and, and, and your internal team could, in a sense, host uh, recruiters uh, post, sorry, they could respond to job cats from other companies. Any co anybody could sign up for our site, but we're very careful to work with big staffing firms and with companies. If you don't want that, we will ring fence your employees or if, like, for example, the big staffing firms, their concern is they don't want their employees selling their candidates, essentially, moonlighting, right? So we have a method to control that 100% where anybody at a staffing firm, we just get their names. They have to sign up with LinkedIn. They also have to sign up with a bank account number and an ABA number. It's the only way they can get on our site. So they have to be real, and then we can match them up to the staffing firm. And the same with companies. But companies could certainly um, transfer their HR departments into revenue departments. So if you had a lot of good candidates and you wanted to post them to other jobs and you had some specific expertise, Companies are starting to do that too. So there's some hot brands that are already looking at doing that and converting their HR departments into revenue departments, which is a very exciting trend for us. Source and build a private talent pool from which I can draw uniquely. No one else has access to it. Why would I share that? Well, because there is no such thing as a private talent pool anymore. Everybody can be found on the internet. Most people at this point are on LinkedIn. And any private database you have is going to be going stale well, it's not very just about quickly. Finding them, but understanding who they are, ranking them, knowing their skills and yep. what they're capable of. So, yeah, which is not something you can get just by looking at a LinkedIn profile. Um, I won't say the name of the company, but uh, it's something that goes back to what uh, Jerry was talking about earlier this morning about the candidate experience. And so there's this particular company that's approached us, amazing brand, everybody loves them. Uh, they get 40,000 applications every year because people enjoy their brand, they use their product. 40,000 applications, they hire 400 people a year. A lot of these people are very qualified, they just don't have the spots for them or they just don't fit that company's culture and they're very culture driven, but amazing people, they have a legal department so they get lawyers, they have accountants and, and so they get talent across the board and part of the candidate experience is that we don't know what to do with these people. These people buy our product. They're, they're our, our biggest evangelists. And now we're just basically red stamp, no, goodbye, you know? So what are they going to do? So they've started, um, they've started um, career counseling. Like their, their recruiting department has focused more not on bringing people in because they get the applications. It's more about how do we treat the people as they leave. So they're cultivating. They're trying to, it, right. And, but and, they're not sharing. But they're considering that as part of you know, what they do major. right now. It's not sharing their candidates in the sense it's selling a candidate that applies to a company that's probably not going to get a job anytime in the next three to six months. Now, you as a company can make a choice. You could covet that person and build a confidential database and put a lot of work into 
putting in data that will go stale and will be probably unsearchable because it'll be in an ATS and every big company I talk to says they have millions of people in their ATS and the notes and the sorting, it just doesn't work and it's basically information that's useless. Or you could help your brand by helping that person get a job elsewhere. I'm not saying that this is right for every company by any means, but if you help that company get a, a person get a job at another good company, you've built your brand, particularly if you're in a consumer product, that per person's more likely to use your product and they're gonna be like, wow, that co I applied to this co company A, didn't get the job, but I got a company uh, job at company B uh, and I feel great about company A. And the likelihood that company A was gonna hire that candidate anytime in the near future was very low. So they don't lose anything and in fact they gain, I think, a significant amount of brand um, uh, recognition. Also, I think this whole on-demand economy should change the way we think about hiring. Hiring, I think, is going to move to literally days. It doesn't mean that you're not get, you're going to vet candidates in days and go through your interviewing and onboarding process, but you'll be able to press a button and hire immediately. Find the candidate immediately you want to hire. This notion of building up uh, 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 databases that are maintained internally I just think it's going to go away very quickly. And I wanted to address your question about companies that uh, are willing to share their talent pool and their candidates. I have few examples in mind when IT companies actually created recruitment companies, on like a spin-off, on the base of their sort of uh, database and internal information and starting using that in sort of uh, expertise and judgment that they're generating about con candidates to actually do placements to other IT firms. And so that is happening. And some companies are willing to share their candidates with um, other firms. And I wanted to give the word to Lance because he worked on the recruitment agency side for a long time and it would be interesting to hear his perspective. Yeah, I, uh, I just finished up 11 years with Kelly Services um, okay. out of the corporate headquarters. So I'm pretty familiar with the, with the model. Um, First, first question to clarify something. So if I take my candidate database and I open it up to you and I don't hire the person but you place them somewhere, do I get a check as a company? Yeah. There, we don't have a candidate database. Let me just be okay. clear. Okay, I'm sorry, um, but I open up mine so that it's, search, it's searchable. Yeah, no, so there are no, your recruiters. No, it's not. No, no. What happens is if you wanted to sign up for a platform, you would sign up as a recruiter and, or an agency recruiter and you would be a supplier of candidates. You would only supply candidates specifically to job cast you get. And you'd only get a job cast maybe a couple a week and they'd be highly targeted to your specialty. You would then decide whether or not to submit a candidate real time to that job cast. And you're limited, just so you know, to four candidates. We're not looking for volume. This is not a volume play and it's not a, a data, candidate database at all. It's a transactional site like ordering an Uber car. Once the drive's over, transaction's over. And you would submit those candidates. And by the way, I should just tell you, when you submit a candidate, and this is important, you have to put in complete information. The candidate's resume, LinkedIn link, cell phone number and email address, and a note about the candidate. So you're not submitting candidates you don't know, and the candidate is automatically informed, and they have to confirm their interest before they're even released to the company. So by the time the company's looking at our candidates, They've all been hand vetted by an expert recruiter. They all have complete information to evaluate and contact if you want to take the next step. And importantly, the candidates have all confirmed their interest in the specific jobs. You're not wasting time with people that aren't interested. And so there's no sharing of databases. You're making a qualitative human decision. Do I have a candidate in your database, your network, or who you know that's right for this job? And that's what we're re-empowering, that human element, that last as, mile of human element. As you look at your scaling um, expectations, how are you going to wrestle with some of the issues arising out of the EU's DPA? Well, right now, we're just operating in the United States. We have actually a lot of companies asking if we can go overseas. I would think we're going to have to look at those legal issues. Um, and, but I, I was under the impression that actually the, in Europe, you are required to store candidate uh, information for a finite period of time versus in America, it's it, a long period of time. The, the, the DPA covers all the EU member countries, but how they each individually interpret that varies. You know, France has got some different requirements than the UK does, which is different again than, than, than Germany. I'm sure. So, yeah, yeah that'll, be, that'll be an interesting one for you I'm to sure manage. I'm sure we'll have some expensive lawyers rack up some big fees yeah. and explain to us how we can do that, but I, I'm sure we can accomplish that. But we're not, we're not in Europe yet, yeah. but we okay. will be soon. Okay. We definitely have a lot of demand there. Hi, guys. My name's Craig Haas, and uh, my company uh, is actually Q to Global Test House. We're one of the big providers of uh, 
online assessments, pre-employment testing, and also leadership assessments, et cetera. And we have 30 offices, and our servers are in Germany. Uh, and that is actually one of the most strict places in terms of data privacy. Germany, the Netherlands, uh, is a few places specifically. Uh, and in fact, some of these countries require that data be stored on a server in their country. Yeah, right. yeah. So yeah, it's a more complicated than you think. Right. Um, but just but wanted to raise that. Yes. I actually wanted to add to one point because, for example, in Russia, you are not at all allowed to st to store information in any other country other than Russia. So it's it's a major problem for many recruitment companies, uh, especially if they do recruitment abroad. So, but do you store candidate information, or do you have a database, or not at all? So everything that happens on our site, we obviously store in the background. But the candidate, it's a transactional site. So when a job cast is sent out. It's only, it's sent to a finite number of recruiters and they have 30 days to submit candidates. We're actually very likely to cut that at least in half, maybe down to as little as 10 days because all the action's over in the first week. Um, and we don't need to keep it open for 30 days. And when the candidates are submitted back, typically it's maybe five to 10 recruiters at most submitting candidates and they submit on average 1.2 candidates. So we typically, for a company, will get back 10 to 30 candidates pretty much every time, and that's kind of our sweet, sweet spot. And if anything, I want to actually reduce the number to closer to 10, uh, because what do you really want when you want to hire? You want a finite number of highly qualified, inter interested candidates that are re ready to go. You don't need 30. You need about 5 to 10 at the most. So we're moving in that direction and getting better and lower numbers, not more numbers, which is important. Um, so at the end of the job cast, it goes away. It's, the transaction's turned off, and we do not store the candidate information for the company at all. They obviously can download resumes and put them in their ATS, but you know, in a sense, who cares? The good candidates are getting hired and off to another job, and it's, they're coming back to our site, the companies, for another trip. Well, we yeah, yeah. So quote unquote, we own them, but we own them on behalf of our recruiters. So if two, first of all, two recruiters can't submit the same candidate for the same job cast, uh, it will reject the same candidate. Uh, if, if you and I were both recruiters and submitted the, the, the second person, it's first come, first serve. We're about all about empowering third party recruiters and getting them back in the game, so to speak. Um, but when we own the candidate um, for 180 days, our terms are standard. There's no negotiation for companies. It's Again, it's one platform, so it has to be, uh, in a sense, rigid. Um, and so when a candidate is submitted to a company, we own it for that position or a similar position for a standard 180 days. We don't own it across the enterprise. So if that person applies to a job you know, in LA separately, that's their, their business. Uh, but if that company hires that candidate within 180 days for that role or a similar role, we'll build the company and we pay our recruiter. Uh, another another like, important consideration for me when looking at that model is the happiness of recruiter. Because, for example, getting back to that company that I mentioned earlier, Zenith Talent, this is a closed marketplace. They, they us basically use recruiters in India to crowdsource, uh, to, crowd to crowdsource CVs for acquisitions. And they say that the core, their core value is making their recruiters happy. And actually, this recruiter in India can get from eight to $10,000 per month using that platform. And that's actually average check. Like, that's an average what they get from the platform, which is a lot of money for India, like, and even for for US, I guess. Uh, so recruiter happiness is super important and is like the cornerstone of their, their sort of... The Not going to go through it again. I live in India <laughs> and I know the market. So what's going to happen is the RPO market is based in three or four cities. And we can talk after. So I get, if you do this right, what you do is you got all the RPOs are back end because an average salary recruiter in India goes somewhere between four to 600 a month, period. That's it. It's mostly female, 99% female, 1% male. He sits in the corner office and he watches what goes on. Your business model, if you implement it and market it right, and the way to pull this off is, you can basically body shop offshore the entire job anyway, because you don't have the English issues, you don't have everything else. And if you really want to disrupt it, you're bringing a cheap labor opportunity. I'm not here to ruin anyone's day, but I'm going to tell you, they're going to figure this out pretty fast. They already are. <laughs> Just see. Fast because English is not an issue. It's finding on LinkedIn, and they already... Here's the other piece, what's happening. They're all already getting paid access to all the databases because when everyone goes RPO, use my DICE account, use my this account, use this account, 
And I'm telling you, they're doing 13 things at the same time at the same desk. They do it. It is reality. I don't care what you want. And there's certain things in India, no Korea is the number one, but what you're saying is if you pull this off right in market, it actually, you're basically crowdsourcing overseas for people who cost 300. If I'm turning around and I run two shifts, I'm having my night shift just play Recruitify all day long because I have a client paying for the database and access all day long already on LinkedIn. And I'm just going to set up offices. And I'm telling you right now, I can cut the, the marketplace in like 90 days. So We should talk after. You should set up. Uh, but other it's a negative yeah. on the other side because what he's bringing up, and I want to go on the other side, is the relationships. It's a different mentality. It's a body shopping. Let's just throw numbers versus this guy, relationships, quality, and that, where the Western mentality is a lot different. And there's going to be a balance between the two. But I get what he said because I could pick up through your voice and I pick up, and this is going to be something that's going to play out and meld somewhere in there. But I'm telling you right now, I could set up an office in India in three seconds with 20 recruiters at $200 a month and just bang all day long on Ruta Recruitify. 10,000, I'll pay them 1,000 a month and they'll thank me and I can go all day long. And it's, but they're already paid access. They already have the computers. They already have the database. They already have LinkedIn. You have, they are there with T1s doing everything you need here. And the difference is you don't have to put them in a nice office and it's a numbers game. That's all. And it's going to be a reality. So what you're saying is it's happening. It's the question is who's right. going to lead it. There's no, there's, no, there's no question. There's big implications for what you say. I will say this, though. It doesn't preclude good recruiters in the United States because we do have a lot of recruiters in India already signing up for the system. And, you know, our recruiters make more money than we do. So a lot of these guys are making good money. We only collect out of the 14 percent, we keep three. So the recruiters are keeping 11 points. So they're actually making more on a gross basis. So the implications for a lot of these people is big money. And the, at the end of the day, though, our system is scoring the recruiters. And I will say some of the foreign recruiters aren't as good at English and all that. So based on the results of the candidates, it doesn't help to submit a lot. You actually lose points by no, submitting candidates. Right. Marketing, they're not going to yes. There's certain areas where yeah. they've been doing job recruiters for 10 years. Nothing personal, they're going to do it better than you. But you have relations with sales, marketing, they don't even know what that means. Like, yeah, I have to understand marketing. Yeah. There's areas of expertise where there will be value. Exactly. Right. Something that's been effective is, like you were saying, is that an American company will outsource the sourcing through India and come back with the candidates, but that's the <coughs> ultimate filter. Uh, because at the end of the day, you know, it, it's a numbers play for them in India, but the American recruiter is going to look at everything that gets brought through and be the intelligent filter and say, this is not what we're looking for, you're missing the mark, go back and do this again, you know? And so that's what we've seen been really effective, uh, is kind of a hybrid. What I was just going to say was, I know obviously you have the experience in that, and, and that's definitely going to happen, but if, if you're saying the, ca the candidate itself has to agree, a lot of times in my experience, because I managed an offshore team and they just threw paper at you and the candidate never even knew that they were being submitted, you're putting a, a lock on it where the candidate has to agree to it. Yes. So just throwing a bunch of resumes is not going to mean yeah. anything. Everything we do in the way we build our algorithms and every sort of, it, it's all about less. It's not about more. It's actually about giving the can recruiters less jobs that are more precisely uh, matched to exactly their skills and their capacity. If they've they got a lot of job casts, we don't want to flood them. We want to actually spoon feed them so they have a good chance of responding. And then it's also um, when a recruiter submits, we limit them to four. And again, the candidate um, has to consent. But if they misbehave on our site and just put in four and trying to throw four, 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 and there's a lot of no's, they're losing points. And their points, as they go down, they just start getting less job casts. And they see that on their dashboard. So the recruiters become highly aware of they've got to behave well in this playground, and they if they don't, the oh yeah, they see their points go and they freak out when they when they lose points, and they love it when they gain points. Um, How often they gain? Well, good candidates that get submitted and confirmed by the candidate, that's a point. Candidates that are swiped yes by the company, those are points. Company <laughs> candidates that are hired, those are points. Um, bad behavior though. Four candidates, none of them uh, confirm, you lose points. Candidates that are confirmed but are swiped into the no, not interested category, you lose more points. So you're losing and gaining points all the time. And that's really, um, our, our earlier on, we didn't have that point system and recruiters were submitting four candidates. They had four slots, it's pretty much every time. Now, the average is 1.2 per job when a recruiter gets a job cast on average 
they submit 1.2 candidates to that position, which is good. That's what we want. We want less. We want them to really think about who they're submitting. And 91% of the candidates confirm their interest. So virtually all of them are talking to the candidate and confirming, are you interested in this job before they submit them? Uh, and I'd probably argue most of the other 9% is the, the emails are probably going in the spam folder. So, you, um, I want to rewind a little bit. You talked earlier on, you outlined some work in the collaboration economy and where it's going and what it's doing. Um, and it's obvious it's making some significant shifts in what the workplace looks like and what work is. Okay. At what point does your model put you directly in competition with Olance, Elance, Odesk, TaskRabbit, Fiverr, because when I start looking at jobs, which are now becoming customized, you know, we're, we're, we're deconstructing the job. So you only need me three days a week. You don't actually need me five days a week. And frankly, you only need me six months to do whatever it is you want me to do. At that point, you start to compete with some of these other folks. How, how does that scale when yeah. you're, it's not just a full-time position, it's I need a global HR guy three days a week for the next six months, period. Right, right. Well, you know, if you sort of look at the age of different ages, you know, we have the age of the corp company, uh, of, the, of countries, the age of the corporation. I think we're moving into an age of the worker, essentially, where your skills can be rented agilely whenever you want to sell them, essentially, and wherever you want to sell them. You know, look, in the very long term, maybe we all go to this organic world where we just kind of work when we want to work and people are kind of paying us. Um, I, I think it's going to be a long time before companies are not going to want a core group of employees that are you know, part of their company, part of their corporate culture, and are reporting to duty, so to speak, every day. But I think that the, I, I love the Elance model, and I think it's great, and I think it works in certain areas. I don't think it's going to overtake the whole economy anytime soon. So there's plenty for everybody. OK, good. Um, well, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate your time. And if you have any questions uh, uh, or comments, I'm here for a little while afterwards. Thank you so much. Yep. Good. Good. Good.